So we'll move into why we're here to create this change, to voice that we need to change healthcare. So we're, t we're using simulation to train clinicians for real world medicine. How can we incorporate teaching clinicians to own their mistakes in an environment that is both multidimensional and so happy at the same time? What can we do? As we all look at Ben. Can you, read, can you say that one more time, Jamie? Okay. I, I, so we are using simulation to train our clinicians for real, real world medicine. How can we incorporate teaching clinicians to own their mistakes in an environment that is both multidimensional and so happy at the same time? These are getting more challenging to answer as they're going along. Yeah. Then I'll give you a minute to think if you want. I was, was going to please go ahead. Okay, I was going to politicize the question <laughs> okay, for a few minutes. Right. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that uh, I have a friend who is a lawyer and, and defends hospitals and physicians um, when they are sued by patients. And uh, one, he's just a very genuine man, like through and through uh, good person, even though you're probably all sitting in the audience and like, uh-huh, you've really drank that Kool-Aid, hope. <laughs> um, but, you know, dear friend of our families, and, you know, he told me very early on when I met him um, that my best defense was actually to own my mistake right away and to tell the patient. Um, and, you know, he's been practicing law for, for 30 plus years, so he really knows what he's saying. And uh, I think the more that we share some of those truths, uh, the less scary it becomes. Um, I already get the opportunity to implement that in my practice. <laughs> so um, I think I, I, my personal experience has been that people respond really well to that. Um, and we need to do it. We, we need to say that, that we messed up and, and claim it in the moment um, because that silence uh, and stagnation only only creates more anger and fear. We're actually seeing in Montana that the insurance industry is recognizing that simulation reduces harm, and they're starting to incentivize that. So to the specific part of your question about how do we uh, create a positive environment where clinicians feel empowered to speak and to share what they know uh, and what they've learned, to let them share with the rest of the team. They almost landed the helicopter with the wheels up so that someone else doesn't, and reduce litigation. I think it's about the insurance industry uh, because they are the 500-pound gorilla in the room. They can affect legislation. That would be, if I had a magic wand, how I would go about doing that, would be to have them work towards uh, reducing the information that can be considered discoverable, I think that's a huge part of this. And to have simulation incorporated into after action planning. And so by that I mean we, we will build simulations that are based upon actual events that have happened where there was a bad outcome. And we'll explore why that happened. And by being able to reenact it, you do a couple of things not the least of which is you allow the providers, all of whom are profoundly affected by a mistake that they make, uh, to experience the event again. We know through very well substantiated uh, research in the cognitive behavioral therapy field that being able to repeat something uh, but to do it well will change the way that we process it as we move forward. Uh, so I think that being able to have legal support to reduce the number of frivolous and unnecessary lawsuits through rapid early candor and disclosure uh, connected with the industry behemoth, which is the insurance industry, to reduce overhead costs, which is where you can get some of the money to do this, and then produce legislative protection so that people can go out and they're expected to disclose their error rather than encouraged to hide it. 
So we're gonna move into what is going on in Gallatin Valley in Montana. Okay, so what is being done in Gallatin Valley in Montana as a whole to improve patient safety and reduce medical errors? Gallatin Valley is actually, so there's a couple of really fascinating things that, that started here, uh, not the least of which is uh, the simulation program, Pulsera, we kind of, for some reason, ended up being this really unique space for this. Um, what I would point to is there was a program started here uh, eight or nine years ago now um, that was really focusing on improving the percentage, the number of people who provided uh, hands-only compression uh, CPR. And um, if I had the numbers off the top of my head, I could quote exactly what our survival rate was before they did that and after they did it. But I can tell you we've gone from the single digit likelihood to the double digit likelihood of survival uh, because providers said, look, we think that <clears throat> by training more and more people uh, in compression only CPR, we can have a positive impact. And that was a great example of people who had no particular um, historical background in safety saying, you know, we can do better than this, and then getting people involved uh, throughout Gallatin Valley. And as Sherry could probably speak, this, this program got picked up by the state and is now distributed statewide. And so that's a great example, I think, of things that have happened in our county that are, are going and growing and going other places. Yeah, and as part of that program uh, for pre-hospital, um, we have a program within our office where um, if an EMS agency has run a cardiac arrest call, um, they're able to then send the data from their um, cardiac monitor to our office where it is annotated, the, the whole code is looked at, it's annotated and then sent back to that agency to show um, areas for improvement. Uh, so that's been, that's been huge. Um, and, and just the data collection and the use of that data uh, we're participating in the Cardiac Arrest Registry for Enhanced Survival, which is a program that originated out of the CDC and Emory University uh, that uh, helps us to look at cardiac arrests uh, at the local level to, uh, to determine things like bystander CPR and uh, uh, public access defibrillation. Uh, it looks at the EMS response, it looks at times, and you know, it, it really tracks that cardiac arrest and we can make some recommendations through that data uh, for the local agencies on, on how they can maybe improve cardiac arrest outcomes. And we can really see the difference in communities. We have one community that has implemented um, a, a robust uh, bystander CPR program where they're, they're teaching um, hands-only CPR and their survival rates um, climbed by several percentage points um, over the last year since they implemented that program. Uh, and we can, we can see in other communities where they don't have a program for that and bystander CPR is really low. And obviously if with bystander CPR being low, the survival rates are very low in those communities. Uh, so, it's, uh, so we've been doing that within EMS. And then the, the trauma system is another one that we can hold up and say, uh, we, we can really see some improvements in patient care. Um, each trauma region sets their own benchmarks. Um, they report to the trauma registry. Um, within our office, uh, we look at that trauma registry and find the patients that fall out uh, from, you know, they don't meet those benchmarks and then those cases are reviewed at the local level uh, with EMS, the, uh, the initial receiving hospital and then onto the tertiary care and, and through discharge. And we're able to uh, improve patient care in that way. <clears throat> and again, that's one that we know we have um, some protection um, from discovery for that program. Um, even though we don't have protection from discovery for the cardiac arrest program, uh, it's the right thing to do. And uh, that's, that's really what we push is, is let's do the right thing. Uh, we had a <clears throat> attorney speak at our trauma conference two years ago uh, about HIPAA and uh, the issues surrounding that and, and the, the problems we run into with um, compiling information on cases because people don't truly understand HIPAA and they don't understand that it's okay to divulge that information um, when we're looking um, at education. Uh, and one of the things that she said was that um, 
many times in Montana, um, even though HIPAA doesn't apply, um, there are confidentiality statutes within the state that do apply. Uh, and, and so if you followed it to the letter of the law, much of what we're doing with trauma and cardiac arrest um, truly isn't protected. Uh, but again, she stood up in front of everybody and said, but it's the right thing to do. So continue to do what you're doing. <laughs> But she put that little doubt, you know, in your mind. But uh, so we just we just try to continue to do uh, what's right for the patient. Okay. So how are how is uh, Montana medical providers an organization? Oh, I can't even speak anymore. It's getting late. How are Montana medical providers and organizations embracing simulation and training to reduce medical errors? How how have they taken on to simulation and education programs? We have, in the last two years, provided simulation training to 5,400 learners uh, at last count, uh, which when you take into account all of the other education initiatives in the state of Montana is more than all of the other learners combined. And so at the end user level, at the provider level, who people who are taking care of the other human beings, Simulation is wildly successful. It's been dramatically embraced. It's becoming, there's an ethical imperative that's being discussed around simulation. Uh, that, that is basically, um, you have a responsibility to provide training using simulation for the exact same reason that they described in the film that we've talked about earlier. Uh, it's been a little bit more challenging on the uh, administrative side. I think I alluded to that earlier. Uh, this is a new line item in, a, in tight budgets in healthcare um, that takes a lot of convincing. Uh, and we have pretty significant penetration across the state. We're lucky to be able to leverage a, a public private partnership with interest from the state, uh, the nonprofit, and then our organization, uh, Best Practice Medicine, as the sort of small business entity attached to it. Uh, a great example of that for those of you who saw the pediatric simulators that were here earlier. Those are being made possible because uh, Sherry's boss, a gentleman named Jim, uh, was able to uh, write for grant to the CDC and will be using that equipment to uh, train providers on how to resuscitate children born to mothers who are chemically dependent, uh, which is becoming an increasing problem, and uh, also to uh, help train first responders in accidental pediatric overdoses, uh, which we also uh, believe is an increasing problem. Uh, so at the end user level, there is a lot of support. Um, at an administrative level, the support is growing. When we first started, we were creating a totally new marketplace. This didn't exist in our state. And so the conversations were around, uh, we don't need this. This is foreign to us. We don't like it. You're uh, doing something that's upsetting our normal way of doing business. Uh, please go away. And the, we persisted, and I'm really encouraged because now the conversation is around, well, it's too expensive. And we can work with it's too expensive. There are a lot of things you can do around that conversation if it's too expensive. And so I think we're on a very good track. We've got a great trajectory. Um, and I think that we will ultimately succeed uh, and we'll be able to make sure that every provider, every person who's practicing medicine in the state of Montana has access to the kind of training that they deserve. Uh, which was foundationally why we started this whole thing in the first place. And I agree with you. I think simulation is very important, and I think we all agree on that it's, as a whole. Um, proper training and simulation is needed to reduce medical errors. We can agree on that, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, but how can rural Montana hospitals afford multi-million dollar simulation facilities? And I'll go one step further. And educational organizations afford simulation? That is the $1.3 million question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually 1.356. That's, that's what it costs for us to operate. Three labs, staff is 16 people. We just did a count for our presentation this last week. It's 212 years of experience in the clinical field, 183 years of experience as clinical educators just on that team. Uh, to say it's inexpensive would be inaccurate. To say it's expensive is all relative. Uh, so the idea behind 
mobile sim is that uh, that equipment is very expensive if you're going to buy it and use it at your own singular facility. Uh, however, if uh, Zach's using it at his facility on a Tuesday and Sherry's using it on a Wednesday and Chris has it on Thursday night and then Hope needs it on Saturday, the cost of operations is then spread across a very vast area. The, the math's pretty simple, actually. There are 58 hospitals in the state of Montana, roughly 120 EMS transporting services, and about a dozen or so allied health education programs. If you divide that cost of operation out, um, it actually ends up being a fairly insignificant amount per facility if everyone is engaging with it. So that's our ultimate goal, is to be able to say, let's get this as inexpensive as we possibly can. From my perspective, I'm still waiting for that one person to walk up and say, you know, we so believe in this, here's $35 million, you don't have to worry about the money for a while, just go and do good work and change lives. But we have to worry about the money because without money, there's no margin, and without margin, there's no mission. But if that person is sitting here in the audience tonight, we yes. yeah, we'd love to talk <laughs> welcome you to come up and speak with Ben later and make Please sure you get on the ben. schedule. He will take payments. <laughs> um, one more question. Do you have any examples of successful error prevention in Montana? And what do you think was the primary factor in helping prevent those errors? I think quantifying successful error prevention is, is still an ongoing challenge because it's not one one thing or one area that you're preventing the errors in. So we just had a celebration last week at my hospital, the Community Medical Center in Missoula, and I texted my husband, I might be, might be late getting home because they're giving us treats for not killing anybody for the last two years. Um, and <laughs> that's like the really dark humor that we kind of acquire being in the medical field, so please, Forgive me if that really offended you. Um, we have not had any, you know, central line infections or, or C. diff um, transmissions or, you know, um, catheter-associated urinary tract infections. But those are three that, as, you know, as a government and as, uh, you know, as America, we have decided we're going to focus on. So um, we can certainly say... We, sh we should celebrate that, absolutely. We should celebrate that. Um, we should not say things like I texted to my husband. Um, <laughs> but at the same point, like that's, you know, maybe, maybe that's kind of a drop in the bucket for, for the numbers that we're looking at, you know, uh, holistically. And how do we start to calculate those other, those other um, errors that aren't so quantifiable? Um, not as easy. So uh, I'm gonna follow up with one question. So do you think the use of simulation in both schools and in hospitals and clinics, pre-hospital, EMS, everywhere, do you think that will help reduce the way we treat patients, number one, and reduce errors? Uh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And, and, I, and I say that because we just actually concluded a, two short studies. The first one was we went back and we took a random sampling of our 5,400-something learners and and we looked to see whether they felt that the simulation training had translated well into their clinical practice, and then we looked to see whether or not they had improved competence and confidence as a result of that. And overwhelmingly, uh, in the 90, 95 to 98 percentile, uh, the answer was yes, this, this has made a difference. The, to your previous question, uh, I think it actually goes back to what we're saying. We don't actually know what the errors are because they're not disclosed. I mean, everything we've talked about here. So you can't actually start to measure something uh, until you have decided you want to measure that particular thing. I will share with you that in my own personal experience, uh, Zach was the medical director for the helicopter service uh, for a while, and uh, I participated in a simulation that he ran, and I had a, a ventilator setting kind of backwards in my mind. I sort of had turned it around somewhere in my training or in my education or just that morning. And I can tell you that it was not shortly thereafter I was picking up a patient uh, that had a very similar uh, 
presentation of the case that we had worked on. Uh, and I'm confident that had I not had that simulation experience uh, with somebody who knew what they were doing, who could help create an environment for me to not feel threatened, but to be inviting to engage and to think differently. Um, Zach's one of the people that taught me the concept of, you know, adults don't learn by finger wagging. We never have, you know, saying, you know, thou shalt do this. It only sort of sticks as long as we're afraid of whoever's saying thou shalt not do this. It's only when we create an environment where we invite learners to come in and say, we'd like to show you that there's a different way and explain why, and you can choose to engage in that or not. It's up to you. And so for me personally, I, I have that experience of I know that it's prevented error in my own clinical practice. You know, it makes intuitive sense that simulation is set up to address. So what Ben was talking about with his example is something called a latent safety threat. So he did not know that this was a gap in his knowledge. He did not know that this was a potential error waiting to happen. So it makes sense that simulation can address both latent safety threats, which are the unknown unknowns, and active safety threats to patients, which are known unknown or known knowns. <laughs> Getting all Rumsfeld here for a minute. Um, you know, so I, I do think just to kind of put some technical terms on what he's describing, simulation is definitely well positioned to address those things. And I think that um, in terms of improving the patient outcomes. I think that the active safety threats are the things that we know about, these catheter-associated UTIs or C. diff transmission or uh, wrong site, wrong med, those are active safety threats. The sneakier ones, and I think the ones that we probably don't, again, have a way to quantify and just exist underneath uh, you know, underneath the covers until we run a case that exposes them are the latent safety threats like, like Ben was just describing. So, um, you know, I think it, it's not just addressing something that you know to be a problem, but it's mm -hmm. exposing things that you don't know to be problems. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because if a helicopter crashes, there could be up to four or five fatalities. If a plane crashes, there could be hundreds. And what we're dealing with is one at a time with, as the film said, people who are already sick. Mm -hmm. And then each one is it's almost unique, but when in its aggregate there's trends. And then you go back to what um, I heard a number in the audience talk about was they really gravitate to the Swiss cheese model. So there's systems and there's regulation and there's initial training, ongoing training, and simulation and technologies. And you put them all together hopefully we're gonna be moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I agree. I will agree from the educational standpoint that when I first met Ben and saw the SIM truck, I, I ran straight up and said, we have to have this for our program. And each one of our students that just graduated were the starting point of simulation with, with best practice. And I can say those students absolutely got so much out of that simulation. And now they're mostly, they. They took their boards, so they are now nurses, So, and they are better for it. And so I want to thank Ben. I want to thank everybody associated with best practice, and I want to thank the audience tonight for the questions, and hopefully we will be able to post something for the questions that didn't get answered tonight on, the, on best practice, so maybe we can come together as a group to answer those questions. But I want to turn it over to Ben thank to you. close us out for tonight. Awesome. Well, um, I don't know if you can tell, but we've all been sitting here for a while, so my butt's gotten flat, so I'm gonna stand up while we close out. Um, I, I know that uh, it's a late evening, it's a Friday night. Um, I really appreciate those of you who have... Oh, it's Saturday night, see, yeah. <laughs> late, a, late, as late. As if to late, prove late my Friday. point. <laughs> uh, but I do wanna thank you for participating here this evening. Uh, I know uh, a number of folks had to leave as, as sort of things were uh, winding down here, but um, I do want to uh, thank our panel for spending time with us tonight. Um, it was very <laughs> generous of them. And uh, last but not least, I, I wanna thank you uh, for spending some time with us. I hope this has been 
uh, thought-provoking. I hope you uh, will share what you've learned here today uh, with other people in your communities or in your groups of friends. Um, and we would like to let you know that uh, if you would like to learn more about our program, uh, you can go to two different places. You can go to bestpracticemedicine.com. That's our company's website. And then you can also go to mobilesimmontana.org. That's the Simulation in Motion Montana program. I really do hope that we're going to have uh, an increasing presence as time goes by. And if you think of a way that you can help us make uh, the connections with the people that we want to be making connections with, please do let us know. Uh, our offices are right up at the old Life of Montana building. We're the only ones up there. Um, we're almost always there. The coffee is always bad, uh, but we're always there. Um, so please uh, stop by and visit us at any time. And uh, have a safe night, and thank you so much for coming out.